Well, it is certainly good to be here with God's people. And I want to encourage you to take a Bible, study along with me, think with me. Good to be back here. Appreciate those who filled in so well last week. And I want to begin with something that happens from time to time. You know, one of the first things that a visitor will notice about most churches of Christ is there's no instrumental music. And sometimes people will ask me, well, why do churches of Christ not have instruments of music? And I always try to say this, look, I can't answer for all churches of Christ. There are some churches of Christ, or have that name, that have instruments of music. And there may be churches of Christ that do not have instrumental music simply because, well, they've just never had it. It's just a tradition. I I can't even answer for every single person here. There may be some here who it's just tradition. I can answer for myself, though. And my answer is that I don't want to have instrumental music in the worship because it's not found in the New Testament. That I can read in passages like Ephesians 5.19 about speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, or the companion passage in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I will point out that in the New Testament, I can read about singing, but I can't read about the playing of instruments. And the answer will come back to me many times that, well, it's not prohibited, is it? You know, you say it's not taught in the New Testament, but in the New Testament it never says you can't have instrumental music. And and that leads to a discussion of What is God's silence? What does God's silence on a subject really mean? I take the position that, and generally we ought not view it as permission, but I will tell you, sometimes people think that discussions about the silence of the Scripture is some thing that happens among churches of Christ. Discussions about the significance of the silence of the scriptures go back at least to the time of Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli, you know, in the 1500s. You know, some of you remember those days, but not, that was before my time, you know. It, now, it's, it's a 500-year-old discussion at the very least. Now, but what does God's silence mean? Well, I am convinced that it is not the way I'm going to authorize, that I'm going to justify my actions, that I can't say, well, we can do this because God didn't say you couldn't do it. And I come to that conclusion through several things. First of all, in John 16 and verse 13, Jesus made a promise that the apostles would be guided into all truth. Everything that God needed us to know was going to be revealed. The auditorium class this quarter and every class next quarter is learning 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Not only is the scripture inspired of God and able to rebuke and exhort, it is able to make the man of God complete. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. What God wants from me is revealed to me. He warns us not to go beyond what is written. In 1 Corinthians 4, in the midst of that discussion of division, the lack of unity that's centered around, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, you know, these divisions... Paul says in verse 6, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, 
Now he doesn't mean that people weren't saying I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. He says, I didn't call out the ringleaders of the division. You know, I, I didn't call your names out. I could have done that. But he said, I just chose to mention myself and Apollos. And he, he also had mentioned Cephas. He said, because I want you to learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Stay with what's written. 2 John 9 is really a critical passage to how we're to understand God and His revelation. And sometimes people use the term hermeneutics, how you interpret the Scripture. But to me, this is a key passage to forming a proper hermeneutic. Whoever transgresses, some of your translations say, whoever goes onward and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. The word abide means to dwell, to live. Where, where do I live? He said, I ought to live in the doctrine of Christ. That's my home if I'm what I ought to be, not somewhere else. You know, I think if, if I'm to do God's will, in Matthew 7, 21, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. In order to do, I've got to know. Well, how do I know? Do I guess? Do I just take and say, well, he never said I couldn't do this. He never prohibited all the... Or do I listen to what he says and take that along with the fact that he says that he will equip me to every good work? Is the scripture not complete? There are some passages in which silence speaks very loudly. One is Matthew 19, this divorce passage. Is it lawful to divorce your wife for just any reason? Have you not read? And then he reads two, or quotes two passages that don't say a word about divorce. They said in the beginning, he made them male and female. And he said, for this reason a man shall, you know, leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Not a word said about divorce. And he concludes from that. So then, they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. The argument of Jesus is that if God in the beginning joined them and said nothing about separating them, then leave them joined. In Hebrews, the seventh chapter, when he is discussing the change of the law. And there had to be a new law, he says, because the old law made priests from the tribe of Levi. Well, Jesus wasn't from the tribe of Levi. He was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so he said there had to be a different law. For verse 14, For it is evident that our Lord spoke from Judah, of which tribe... Moses spoke nothing concerning pr priesthood. Moses spoke nothing. God didn't say he can't be. You know, that's not his poor argument. He does. And I've, I've mentioned this before, I think, but it, I think it's worth mentioning again. One time in a Bible class where I met, we're in Hebrews, somebody said, well, couldn't you, and started ticking off a number of Old Testament passages, put these all together and reach the conclusion that a priest couldn't be from the tribe of Judah? And I said, absolutely. You could reason through a, a number of passages and reach that conclusion. But the Hebrew writer felt like it was perfectly adequate to just simply say, Moses spoke nothing. He didn't have to go through all of these you know, logical conclusions that would have been valid. He just took the short approach 
and validated that approach. Silence is important. But that raises some serious questions. Sometimes people say, well, I understand what you're saying, but then again, it seems to me like there's some inconsistency on your part. I don't read in the New Testament about a meeting place like this. I don't ever read about people using song books or projectors to project the singing or even a song leader. The argument is you're being inconsistent about your use of silence. And I will say this, if I'm inconsistent, what that proves is I'm inconsistent. It does not justify any practice, whether it be the church building, the song book, or the instrumental music. If I'm truly being inconsistent in my approach, then I'm inconsistent in my approach and I need to modify that. But, I think what we can see as we go through this lesson, and I hope we can, is there's a sense in which silence does permit while also being restrictive, as I've already talked about. I'm just now to the title slide. I want to, how do we react to God's silence? And I think to react to God's silence, we need to understand some important concepts. God speaks to us through the scripture in some ways that are very specific. And then he speaks to us sometimes in some ways that are more general, that are broader, more discretionary, in order to carry out any commandment of God, whether it be a commandment that is very specific in its nature or a commandment that's more general. Sometimes you have to use Sometimes people have called expedience an aid, a tool to do the job. And you may, you, I believe we are justified in using tools to do the job God has given us. What must never happen though is we must never alter or make additions to the job God has given. Now, I hope the rest of this lesson will make all of that clear. At the, on the back page of your items, I've got some questions that all relate to the lesson. And I hope that by the time the lesson's over, these answers become clear. I want to go back to Noah and the ark. I want to show you some things to illustrate, and these are not new to me. Many of you have heard these before. But in Genesis, the sixth chapter, God is fed up with the world. It's only evil continually. He's going to destroy the world. But he offers Noah and his family a way of escape. And even the children know the way of escape. He's to build that ark. He's to take the animals on the ark with him. Notice how specific some of the instructions are. Verse 14 Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. Its width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second and third decks. In chapter 7, verse 2, you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Of what was the ark to be built? Uh, anybody can read that and say it was to be made of gopher wood. Now when he says gopher wood, did he mean simply mean wood? D no. When he said gopher wood, if the specific gopher wood is not the same as wood, it's a type of wood. 
If God didn't care what it was made of and just wanted wood, he could have said wood. He didn't say that. Now, the ark was monstrously big. You know, 300 cubits is probably about 450 feet. A football field and a half in length. But let me ask you, when he said 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits, which is big, is that all he meant? Was make a big boat, a big floating barge. No. And you think about the fact that every other possible dimension you could think of, and you could calculate, you multiply 300 by 50 by 30 and figure up how many cubic cubits that was, and you could come up with some other sizes that would have the same amount of storage space. But I would suggest to you, when Noah was told 300 by 50 by 30, he knew that every other size was excluded. God didn't have to give him the list of all the ways he couldn't do it. How many decks did it have? He talked about three. Was Noah free to decide, well, you know, as I'm building on this, I think two will be enough. Or I may need four. You know, the number of animals. He didn't have any choices, did he? Do you see? I mean, it's, it's easy to see that these things are very specific. And specific instructions exclude things. When it is gopher wood, then all the other woods are excluded. When it's three decks, it's not two, it's not four. Yet, every commandment was not that specific. How do you build an ark that big? What kind of tools do you use? He never mentions a single tool. And yet we know that there had to be tools. You had to have some kind of tools. I'm, I'm certain he didn't have you know, electric tools. You know, he didn't have pneumatic tools that we would use today, but... He had some kind of tools. You know, how wide were the planks? You know, he has to end up 300 by 50 by 30. How wide are these things supposed to be? What about the animals? He was specific about the number. But where was he supposed to put the animals? How old were the animals that he was to bring onto the ark? You know, how, how was he to do all of that? Because God didn't specify, I think everybody would understand there, the fact that God didn't say, okay, take this tool, then Noah was left to choose whatever tool works best. And maybe to borrow from something I said a few weeks ago, if in the middle of building the ark, some salesman came along with a better tool than he had been using, you know, somebody, you know, was really inventive, then he could have switched tools. Come up, somebody's got a better saw, a better hammer. We'll use that. If God doesn't specify the tool, you've still got to do the job. And that's what's important. If God tells us to do a job and doesn't specify the tools to do the job, that doesn't excuse us from doing the job. We've got to figure out what tools work best for doing the job gave us but now think about this we would understand that Noah would probably need some kind of an axe a saw a hammer you know some kind of whether they were rudimentary or not you know at least some kind of that okay is, is Noah justified in grabbing a saw to build the ark certainly but what if Noah decided that in addition to this 300 by 50 by 30 ark, I'm going to take that saw that God, God certainly allows me to use this saw and this hammer, and I'm going to build a couple of supplemental boats because I really don't want to be in the boat for as long as I may be there with the goats and the skunks 
and you know, a few other animals that he thinks are kind of smelly. You know, so he says, you know, I'm going to build them. No, he can't do that. That would be adding to God's word. That would be different. You know, if you took and you decided you want to be creative and some of your planks are going to be four inches and some are going to be eight inches, God just said build it out of gopher wood to size. Then you decide, I'm going to alternate oak and gopher wood. We all understand the difference in that. You know, we understand that when it came to the number, Noah didn't have a choice about how many of each animal to take on the boat. But he had a choice as to whether he says, you know, I'm a cat person. Though being a righteous man, I don't think he was. Uh, <laughs> that's a joke, folks. You know, but now, what if he wanted the cats next to him and he wanted the dogs as far away as possible? Or the reverse. He wanted the dogs next to him and the cats as far away as possible. Those are things that he, he could choose. He could make those decisions. I think we understand very easily that God was silent about barges and oak. But Noah understood those were not allowed because God had been specific. But we also understand that when God didn't tell him, okay, this is where I want you to put the specific animals that I've told you to bring, that he had the choice of how he would do that. Those are just simply aids to doing the job God told him to do. Now turn to Numbers 19. And I want to look at one other Old Testament story. Numbers 19 is part of the, the law that required one to be cleansed of defilement. And he's particularly talks about contact with a dead person. And the waters of purification contain some ashes. Now, let's read this and note how specific he is about certain things. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they may bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which a yoke has never come. You shall give it to Eleazar the priest, that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered there. It's slaughtered before him, I'm sorry. And Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the heifer shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, its flesh, its blood, and its offal shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast them into the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. And then jump down to verse 9. Then a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place and they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water of purification. It is for the purifying from sin. Now, you understand all that? They would take a red heifer, burn it down to ashes. They are to put cedar wood, hyssop, scarlet into it. And then somebody is to take it, the ashes, and store them in a clean place. Now think about this. When God said a red heifer, what did he mean? And I'm, I'm going to give you just a quick tutorial for those of you not familiar with the bovine family. We use the term cows sometimes generically for all cattle. Bull is Mr. Cow. Cow is Mrs. Cow. And heifer is Miss Cow. A heifer is a female who has not yet born a calf. That is what a heifer is. It is a female of the bovine persuasion who's never had a calf. Now when he said red heifer, you think he meant, oh, black heifer will work just as well. 
Remember, this thing's going to be burnt in a fire down to ashes. Why, what would it matter what color its hair is if you're going to burn it to ashes? You think you meant a red bull? Again, why would the gender matter if you're going to burn it down to ashes? But yet we know if he said a red heifer, he didn't mean a black heifer. He didn't mean a red bull. He meant a red heifer. And I have no idea. No idea why. The color. The gender. The age. You know, this is the younger one. Why it mattered. But I know he was very specific. Does he say anything about, now, don't put a white lamb in there with it? And yet, I don't think there would have been an Israelite alive who would have said, you know, we're also going to add a white lamb to this. No, they knew what God was asking. Why did he tell them cedar into this fire? I don't know. But I know this. Once he said cedar, they knew exactly what wood to use, what not to throw in there. Where were they to store the ashes? Verse 9 says, store them outside the camp in a clean place. What do you store them in? You had to have some kind of vessel, didn't you? You can't store these ashes. And remember, the camp would move from time to time. They had to be able to be transported. He's so specific about red heifer, about the cedar wood, you know, the hyssop, and yet when it comes to the ashes, you store them. You choose where to put them. They had to have something, but he didn't specify it. So it was up to them to make that choice. Come to the New Testament with me. Well, there we go. Matthew 28 and verse 18. The Great Commission. You, you see these same principles. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All the power, the right to rule is mine. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And you could also take Mark 16 in this. Verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Is there anything specific about this? Oh, absolutely. They had no choice, no discretion in the message to be preached. They were to teach the things Jesus commanded. They were to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, you might recall Galatians 1. You know, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. He was very specific about the message to be preached. He was specific about the people to be taught. Though it took them a while to figure it out. They were to preach it to every creature. Make disciples of all the nations. They eventually understood that part of it. But think about some other things. Every detail wasn't as specific. You know, by what means were they to go into all the world? Were they to go on foot? Were they to go you know, on by boat? Ride donkeys, camels, chariots? How were they to go? How were they to teach? You think about, there were times we read about Paul on foot. Times he's in a ship. We can read about Philip doing his teaching while riding in a chariot. Teaching. We see them preaching sermons in the synagogue, in the marketplace. We see them debating in the synagogue. We see them writing letters. They use different forms of teaching. 
All of these. And what's so beautiful about this, it makes for such easy application in changing times. Do we have the same modes of transportation today they did? Well, we've got, we've still got our feet available and we use them some. But most of the time, instead of a donkey, we get in a car, a truck. But God never said which way to go. You know, we may use the internet to teach. But what do we get in our car and go and teach? What do we utilize the internet to teach? It has to be that same message that was taught in the first century. It has to be that same message. We, you know, he taught them, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Well, wherever there is human life, there's water. And that message will never change. I mentioned our place of assembly as one where people say you're inconsistent because nobody ever mentions a church building in the New Testament. Well, think about what we have in the New Testament. We got specifics about the fact that we must assemble. I mean, we're told we must come together on the first day of the week. Acts 20, verse 7, the disciples gather on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 talks about the whole church coming together in one place. Hebrews 10, 25, the assembly is not to be forsaken. We're given specifics about things done, about eating the Lord's Supper about praying, singing, that a collection is taken, that teaching is done. Those things we are taught very specifically. But are we told where to assemble? Think about that. There are a number of passages. I've just mentioned a few. But there are a number of passages that talk about first century churches coming together. But where? We know they gathered in places like the temple. They gathered in, it would appear, the school of Tyrannus. Sometimes it seems they gathered in private homes. I think there's at least the possibility in Corinth that they had their own place. You know, when the Israelites were told to gather up the ashes and store them in a clean place, God didn't tell them where, but they had to have somewhere to store them, something to store them in. When he tells us to gather, and he doesn't tell us where to gather, we have to figure that out and what's best. I know churches that meet in private homes today because that's best. There are just so few of them. I know churches that in places where property is you know, <laughs> unreasonably high, They rent. But for many, having their own place is the best. We've got to have a place. That's what New Testament churches, they just met whatever was best. But, let's say that since God leaves it up to us to secure a place to worship, we decide we'll secure a place to play basketball, hold dances, which would concern me for other reasons, but those aren't what God told us to gather for. Noah needed a tool to build the ark. Noah couldn't take those same tools and build those companion boats where he was going to put the goats and the skunks. That wasn't what God had taught him to do. We have to find a tool in which we can come together to sing and to pray and to eat the Lord's Supper, you know, to have the, do the things God told us to do. But we don't need a tool for basketball and dances, those kinds of things that you see churches sometimes do, because that's not what God told us to do. Let's finally, let's turn to music. I started out with this, and this is where I want to end up. Are there any specifics? When you look at Ephesians 5, 19, 
And he says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Or Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace. Some of the Bible say thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. I think there are some specifics there. When he says sing, does that mean that we ought to whistle? Does it mean we should hum? Or when he says sing, do you think it's possible that he meant we ought to sing? You know, people can take the Bible and they can understand specifics in most areas. Where, where, is the, where is the authorization, the justification? All four of these, whistling, humming, playing, singing, these are types of music. But what is the one that he specifies? He didn't say just make music. He said to sing. Well, what about songs? What are we to sing? If you'll take note, this is both specific and general. He tells us to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Songs that are fitted for the praise of God and the edification of one another. That's what we're to sing. But he didn't give us a song list. He didn't give us a list and say, now these are the 30, 40, 50, 100 songs that you can choose from. It's up to us to choose from psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We can choose those. What type of singing are we to do? You know, we could sing as we typically do four parts, or every now and then it seems like it's only three because the tenors just, they just disappear on us, you know. But, uh, you know, most of our songs are written in four-part harmony. There's some indication that some of the earliest singing was done more of a chanting style. Sometimes we may just sing all melody. There are a few of our songs written that way. If a song leader were to get up and say, we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me and not put the four-part musical notations up here, that's probably how we would do it. He said sing. He didn't specify whether it had to be four-part, whether it had to be all melody, more of a chanting style of singing. He didn't specify that. He didn't specify whether we had to sing from memory, a book, a screen. If you're going to sing, it requires that you have some knowledge of the words, some knowledge of the music. I've read in years gone by of how People were taught to sing by lining it. Song leader would, he would sing one line of a song. People didn't have any books. If they'd had books, a lot of them couldn't have read them. You know, he would sing it. One line. And they would sing the line after him. He probably had to sing that line several times. They'd go through and they'd learn a song that way. One line at a time. Is that a... Would that be okay? Sure. But most of us can read today. Most of us can follow along. So we put it on a book. Going back to the very beginning, I said I'm against instrumental music in worship because God said to sing. And God never said a thing about a band. Never in the New Testament. Never said anything in the New Testament about playing instruments of music. And somebody will say, but your songbook is no different than the piano. Your projector is no different from our praise band. You know, neither one are mentioned in the New Testament. Well, what I want to say to you today and I hope you'll, I think you'll understand this. One, 
is nothing more than the equivalent to Noah's hammer. The other is the barge for the goats and the skunks. A songbook, a projector, a song leader does nothing but serve as a tool to help us do a job that God has told us to do. Without specifying what tools we have to use other than our voices. But the other, it's added something to God's word. What does sing mean? Does sing mean hum, whistle, play? Sing means sing. Red heifer meant red heifer. Sing means to sing. Let's learn to distinguish. There are things that are aids. They help us carry out what God has said. Then there are things that change what God has said. We're introducing a different type of music. And we don't want to do that. I want us to think about God and what he says about doing his will, Matthew 7, 21. How hard is it to know what God wants from us? How hard is it to know? You know, you start talking about general and specific and aids and additions and people say, well, that just sounds so complicated. And yet, you can go to a passage like Genesis 6. Numbers 19, and you just read through it, and without even going through the thought process of a general and a specific, an aid and an addition, you know what God wanted from Noah. You know what he wanted with the ashes of the red heifer. Why don't we apply that? Just read the New Testament the same way. And I think when we do, We'll understand what he wants us to do. We will understand the problem. Sometimes we're not content with that. We, we have preferences. We have things that we like. And we want to bring these in. Whether it be the music or some other question. It is so tempting to try to find some way to justify doing it the way we like it instead of just simply saying, what does red heifer mean? <laughs> what, what does it mean? That's what we've got to do. When God is general in his instructions, then we do have some latitude. And others have a, the same kind of latitude and they may go about it a little differently. Let's understand that. Use whatever tools are necessary. Allow others to use whatever tools they decide. But let's make sure of this. Whatever hammer I pick up, whatever saw I have in my hand, it's to do God's work and not my own pleasure. That's what's key. So critical. As we close this day, and let me say this before I extend the invitation. If you have questions, concerns about the lesson, please feel free to talk with me about it. But we were looking at earlier at the Great Commission. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Baptism is not a Church of Christ tradition. It's the teaching of Jesus. And if you have never rendered obedience to the terms of the Great Commission, never come in faith turning from your sins to be baptized into Christ, why don't you do that today? We'd love to help if you come while we stand and sing together. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up, and we believe you'll find these to be true to God's Word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, 
please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.